So lesson from the Kings, uh, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times, that's what this uh, class is entitled. Uh, this particular lesson, Saul on the Edge of Greatness, and this is part three of our study of the life of, uh, of King Saul, the last, actually, the last lesson on King Saul before we move on to uh, another character. So we're studying his life uh, as a way to learn actually what not to do with our own lives and how to avoid wasting our potential for spiritual greatness as he did. You know, the point on the edge of greatness. Saul you know, was on the edge of greatness. He had air, all the elements were there for him to do great things in the kingdom of God. And of course he, uh, uh, he failed uh, in that. <clears throat> We've seen um, uh, how God chose him to be king and how at the very beginning he showed tremendous promise as king and leader of God's people. If, if all you read was just you know, what we read last week, uh, you had high hopes for this, uh, for this individual. But then we began to see and review uh, his unfortunate decline in favor with God and in favor with the, the people. And we said that um, um, uh, I pointed out patterns of behavior last, last time, patterns of behavior that led to his downfall. And, and, and I, I pointed out that the pattern of behavior that he had uh, is not something that only existed in his time. We, we see the same patterns of behavior that probably will lead us to problems and trouble even in our, even in our own day. So we saw a pattern of disobedience he just wouldn't do things exactly as God wanted him to do it. It's not that the, that the, that the uh, commands or the, the things that God wanted him to do were complicated or hard to understand. He just couldn't you know, just obey a simple, um, a simple command. Um, he, um, uh, he was told to wait till Samuel got there to do the sacrifice. He didn't wait. He, he offered the sacrifice himself. He was told, you know, wipe out all the, uh, the, the, uh, the Amalekites, wipe them all out, everyone, animals, everything. Well, he won the victory, but he kept some animals. He kept the king. You see, he, he didn't obey right down to the last point. Uh, and, and we all make that type of mistake, right? I mean, everyone disobeys and you know, we, we fall short. But with Saul, it was a pattern. It wasn't just a one-time thing, it was just a pattern in his life. Uh, we saw a pattern of instability. He became flighty and foolish in his decision-making because he didn't seek God out. So he figured he'd do things on his own. He'd run ahead. You know, he, uh, uh, while they're in the middle of battle, he issues an order that uh, the, old, the entire army go on a fast thinking that uh, that'll curry favor with God. Uh, and that backfired on him. The army became so weak that when it had a chance to have a complete victory, it just couldn't take advantage of its uh, military position because everyone was just so hungry. They were famished. And they fell into sin and so on and so forth. Uh, then there was a pattern of open rebellion. I mean, eventually he just refused to take responsibility for his actions and he began blaming other people. Uh, refusing to uh, repent for his sins. And notice all these things, they're kind of connected, aren't they? There's the, you know, they're connected. You know, a, a disobedience does lead to a life of instability, does lead to rebellion, open rebellion. And then of course, a pattern of fear. That's what we began to see as we uh, finished off our lesson last week. We, we begin to see the early stages of insanity that set in as Saul becomes paranoid about his position. He sees everything as a threat to his, uh, to his role. Uh, uh, he sees everyone as a threat to him personally. And of course, this fear so immobilizes him that he's no longer able to lead effectively. And it is at this moment in his life that David steps into the picture. Now, uh, there, uh, you know, the story of Saul and David and so on and so forth has so many chapters. I, we don't have time to read that in, in the 30 or so minutes that we have here, so I'm going to have to compress and paraphrase the story, but I think most of us are familiar with the story itself, and I don't think we'll have any problems following along. So let's uh, talk about Saul and David. Uh, in the midst of Saul's paranoia, God tells Samuel, the prophet, to go and anoint a new king. So in 1 Samuel 16, we see Samuel, led by God, to a man called Jesse, 
and his family of eight sons. Ultimately, Samuel anoints the youngest son, David, to become the next king of Israel. And an interesting story, you know, he goes through each son, the eldest, the next one, you know, the father thinking, well, surely he's going to take my eldest son. You know. uh, no, not that one. Not, and then finally he says, do you have any more? Well, we got one out there you know, tending sheep, bring him in. You know. And that's the one that, that God chooses through Samuel to become the next king. The Bible says that from this day forward, the Spirit of God was with David and he grew in strength and wisdom. So it wasn't just that David already was king material. He was an ordinary young man selected by God and God is the one that began to equip him with wisdom and strength to ultimately be his leader. So at this point, the story abruptly switches back to King Saul. You know, pretend it's a movie or a play. You know, the, so one scene, there's Samuel with David and so on and so forth, and then boom, the scene switches and it goes back to, to Saul. And, and we see his mental state beginning to deteriorate uh, very quickly. Uh, desperate to soothe his nerves, Saul asks his men to find a good musician to play for him and without realizing it, they find David and they bring him to Saul as the court musician. So even though he's been anointed by Samuel, David is dividing his time between tending sheep for his father and from time to time being brought into the royal court in order to comfort the troubled king by playing music for him, perhaps even singing. So uh, as far as the story goes, there is calm for a period of time, but a very real threat from the Philistines is brewing that would thrust David into the spotlight and ultimately make him Saul's enemy and target for many years. So let's move on to the alliance and the annihilation, chapter 17 to 20. So Saul and David begin as allies when the nation is threatened by Goliath and the Philistines. Of course, this is a well-known story where David single-handedly kills the giant and saves the Israelite army from not just loss, but from shame. You know, the, the giant, if you remember the story, the giant would come out, you know, uh, 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 Goliath would come out every morning and he challenged the, uh, you know, he challenged the Israelite army. Come on, send somebody on down. We'll have a fight, whoever wins. You know, if I win, you become our slaves. If he wins, we become your slaves. And every morning he issues this challenge to the, to the army and, 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 and nothing is said, no response. And every day you know, he's winning the psychological battle. Every day he's breaking them down, breaking them down psychologically without even striking a blow. Now what we realize because of our study of Saul is that the reason the Jews were in such trouble was the pathetic state of fear and conflict that their king was in. Because think about it for a second. Who should have been the one to step up to go fight the guy? Well, the king. <laughs> or appoint somebody. So Saul still believed in the presence of God, but he no longer relied on God's saving power. You know, people who say, ah, oh, the man upstairs, you know, yeah, I believe in the man upstairs, the big boss upstairs. I like the different you know, euphemisms that people use for Almighty God. You know, oh, the guy upstairs, my buddy in heaven, you know, he had this kind, of, this, this kind of belief. Yeah, yeah, he's up there, you know, the big man in the sky, the big powwow in the sky, you know, that kind of belief. But not the kind of belief that would drive him to get on his knees before God Almighty and say, please, help me, help us. We're losing, we need your help. That, not that kind of faith. He didn't have that kind of faith uh, uh, anymore. Uh, instead, he trusted in military might, and because of this, he was paralyzed by fear, and he had poor judgment. Now, we know that David won the battle, and because of this, he also won the hearts of the people, right? People were singing uh, praises to Saul, you know, and then when they sang praises to David, they, they, they would say that he, you know, he killed 10,000, know, way more, had uh, bigger military victories, and Saul didn't, didn't like that. And so Saul takes David into his family and his court, 
but eventually would grow jealous of David's success and potential threat to the throne. See, all this time Saul didn't realize that God had already chosen David to succeed him. He didn't know this. Now later on we see Saul personally try to kill David or send him on suicide missions to get rid of him, but David survives and he grows stronger. You know, he says, you want my daughter? Great, you, know, uh, you have to go to the Philistines and king, kill so many Philistines and so on and so forth. I mean, suicide missions, and yet David survives. As a matter of fact, one of David's strongest allies, one of his strongest supporters and friends is Saul's son, Jonathan. And despite his father's murderous plots against David, a beautiful friendship develops between the young prince and the heir to the throne. So united are they that Jonathan actually defends David to Saul. You know, Jonathan is saying to his dad, why are you trying to kill him? Why are you against him? He, he has no harm for us. He's only done good for us. And so demented is Saul that he even attacks his own son because of his defense of David. You know, the idea, are you against me too? Are you on his side too? In the end, Jonathan protects David. But even this is not enough to keep David safe for Saul's out of control rage against. I mean, totally, totally losing all sense of reality here. All right, take a look at Saul's madness, chapters 21 to 24. Like I said, we don't have time to read all these chapters here in our, in our class. So by the time we get to chapter uh, 21, Saul is totally out of control. He is continually focused on finding David and destroying David. Never mind fighting against his enemies. He's wasting a lot of resources and time and energy and emotion trying to find David, who isn't his enemy at all. Now his reasoning is that if David becomes king by popular acclaim, remember, he doesn't realize that Samuel's already anointed him. He's thinking David's just going to become king because he's so popular with the people. So his reasoning is that if David becomes king by popular acclaim, his own son, Jonathan, will lose the throne. And of course, the succession to the throne. Of course, he doesn't realize, as I said, that it's not David's popularity with the people that will gain him the throne. It's God's anointing that will put him on the throne, and he already has it. So Saul's fighting a, you know, a losing battle, and he, he doesn't even know this. And this is what makes this story, this story so, so poignant, so sad. Saul's constant campaign is forcing David to continually be on the move, to collect an army loyal to him, to learn about military strategy and diplomacy and management, all the while on the run. Do you think God had a hand in this? I mean, it's not like that David was actually, he had all the qualities of a king when he was anointed. David was like Abraham. You know, God found Abraham, said, yeah, I'm going to make a nation out of you. Your descendants will be like the stars in the, you know, was there something about Abraham? Was he a especially righteous, brave? No. <laughs> Certainly not brave, right? He lied and he kind of used his wife, you know, sending his wife ahead and say, you know, just tell him you're my sister. You know, there's a brave guy. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's what God was going to do with him if he allowed God to do it to him. But David's the same thing. What is he? Yeah, he was a good looking guy. It says that, ruddy complexion, you know, fair. But he was tending sheep. What was his future, you think? being the eighth son. You think he had some big future in, in mind? No, he'd be tending sheep all his life. God chose this shepherd and said, I'm, I'm going to make something out of you. I'm going to send you to school. And the school he went to was Saul's persecution. Because of Saul's persecution, he learned how to fight. Because of Saul's persecution, he learned how to make arrangements with different groups of people, even some enemies, to stay alive. Because of Saul's persecution, um, he collected many of the people in the land who were disenfranchised because they were under a king who was going mad. 
So God was putting David through school here, preparing him to eventually become the king. It's the same thing with us, we become Christians, right? And I tell you, you're, you're, you're not any more a Christian you know, 50 years after you're baptized than on the day you're baptized. You're not any more saved, but you're a whole lot more sanctified, right? You grow, you learn, you become more fruitful. God puts you through school. Same thing, same thing is, is happening here. So in chapter 21, we read of an episode where David entered a town and he sought out some food. He was hungry. And the only food available was the bread the priests ate after the sacrifice was made, the showbread. Since there was nothing else to eat, he took this and he ate it and he continued on his journey. Saul hears of David's appearance and he comes down upon the city and he massacres all the priests that are serving there. In David's, excuse me, in Saul's reign, this is probably his worst and most despicable act. So bad that even some of Saul's men refused to carry out the order to execute these innocent people. Not only people, but priests of God. So Saul by this time has truly become mad killing not only his so-called enemies, but also murdering the servants of the Lord. I mean, you know he's totally lost it. After this, we see Saul continuing his relentless pursuit of David and seeking the aid of his countrymen in tracking him down. In other words, you know, he, he, he creates a situation with his countrymen that says, you're with me or you're against me. He's, he's forcing them to choose. So, um, He's totally out of control, totally fixated on only one thing, and that is David's demise. Thankfully, God thwarts Saul's campaign by sending the Philistines, once again, to attack the nation. And this diverts Saul's attention from David for a while as he leads the troops against the old enemy. He's still got to do his king work. And part of the king work was to protect the nation. And the main enemy were the Philistines. So in chapter 24, uh, there is a poignant moment where David comes into contact with Saul without Saul's awareness. So uh, you know, Saul is out in the field with the military and he goes into one of the caves in order to relieve himself. But what he doesn't know is that David and some of his men are actually hiding in the cave, at the back of the cave. Now David here could easily kill him, but he spares the king's life. After their encounter, David, from a distance, shows Saul a piece of cloak that he had cut. In other words, he got close to Saul and snipped off a piece of his, uh, his uh, robe. And after everything is over, after they leave the, uh, the cave, he comes out and calls to uh, Saul and he shows him the piece of clothing that he'd cut away from him to show how close he had been to him and how easily he could have killed him. And to me, in all the story of Saul, this moment here, you know, it just tugs at your heart. Saul has a moment of clarity, and he recognizes that David is truly innocent and without evil intentions towards him, and he tells him so. I mean, you can almost, when you read this section, you can almost hear the, the waver in Saul's voice, ready to weep. But his old self takes over, as he takes advantage of David's goodness by extracting a promise from David not to harm his family. He says, I know you're innocent, you're right, I'm wrong, please forgive me, and by the way, will you make me a promise that you won't harm any of my descendants? So the evidence of David's true intentions and character is before him, but Saul reverts to his old fears, renewing his vow to kill David in a foolish attempt to hold on to a crown that he had already lost. He had gained it simply because God had given it to him. He lost it simply because God took it away from him. And so we get to the final stages. Um, in 1 Samuel 25, this, this, this section here goes from 1 Samuel 25 all the, all the way to chapter 31. So in chapter 26, we again read of an opportunity that David had to kill Saul and end his problems, but he doesn't, out of respect for the role of the king, anointed by God. I mean, there's, man, we could, we could talk about that for a long time. 
You know, he's, he's, he's oppressed by the king, but the king is anointed by God. He won't, he won't raise a hand to the king, even if the king is wrong and disobedient to God, it's not David's place to remove him. You need, you need to think about that sometimes when you're, you know, when you're in a situation where you feel oppressed by someone who has authority. So in this episode, Saul again acknowledges that he's wrong, he blesses David and actually prophesies concerning his future success. And in this we see God continually working in not just David's life, but in Saul's life as well. David, through God's help, has an opportunity to take matters into his own hands, but he doesn't. And this is a great example of God allowing someone to choose a lesser opportunity, a plan B solution for their lives, but refusing it in order to wait on God's blessing and full will to be done. Oh man, oh man, oh man. How many times, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know how many times in my own life I've run ahead of God. I've just run ahead. You know, I was saying, you know, Lord, this problem is just taking too long so, and I have the solution. I'm just going to go ahead and fix this. I don't know what your plan is because his plan is always plan A, but I got plan B. And I'm going to put plan B into operation. And you know what? He lets me do it. And there is some sort of solution, but it's never the solution. <laughs> it's never the good solution that I'm looking for. It's my solution. I think, you know, it's a personal opinion here. I think the single most difficult lesson in Christianity is to learn to wait on God. That is so hard, especially if you're kind of A-type, you know, task-oriented, Object motivated, you know, I know I'm like that, man, I got the list. Give me a list. You know, they tell me there are no lists in heaven. Oh my, what am I going to do? No list of things to do, my to-do list. So David says, I, I could solve the problem of the king attacking me and I, me on the run, blah, blah, blah. I could, I could solve the problem here, that's plan B. I just take him out. And if I take him out, you know, who's going to be against me? They're going to say, whoa, way to go, David. This guy was nuts. You did the right thing. You took him out. That's, that was plan B. Plan A was God's plan. And David showed that he was learning to be a servant of God. Why do you think God said he was a man after my own heart? Do you think he said he's a man after my own heart because David was sinless? because he managed to always you know, not sin? Are you kidding me? The guy who you know, conspired to murder, uh, took another man's wife, got her pregnant, you know, this guy? No, he was a man after God's own heart because he was willing to wait for God. That's why God loved him. Saul, on the other hand, is granted a reprieve, a chance to repent, a chance to change. And he does for a moment, but soon he falls back. He would have to hand the kingdom over to David, but he would gain peace of mind and entry into the true kingdom in the process. That was his reward. Unfortunately, he exchanged his soul for a kingdom that really wasn't his to hold on to anymore. That was the sad part. So as we move into chapter 28, the Philistines are attacking once again, and now Saul has no one to help him. He doesn't have David, who at least helped him fight this common enemy. He doesn't have Samuel, the prophet, who guided him and provided wisdom, because Samuel has died by now. Saul was totally afraid, without a plan, so what does he do? He turns to a medium, or a witch, for advice. And this was against the law, and he knew it. So now he's as low as you can go morally. You can't get much lower than this. Even though she's a medium, God uses her anyways to speak to him through the voice of Samuel. You know, I always say, if God can talk to you through the voice of an animal, you know, Balaam, the donkey talked to him. If God can use an animal to talk to you, He can use a person, even a person who claims to be a witch. And through her, God tells Saul why he has failed and what will happen to him the next day, even tells him. 
Even here, God reaches out to Saul, but Saul refuses to repent and cast himself on God's mercy. Boy, if God told me I was going to die tomorrow, my last chance, hopefully I'd jump for it. Then in chapters 30 and 31, we see the contrast between Saul and David as David goes forward and he defeats the Amalekites, while Saul and Jonathan are both killed in their battle against Israel's other enemy, the Philistines. So Saul, wounded in the battle, commits suicide rather than be taken prisoner. But right until the end, there's no call out to God for help, no call to God for forgiveness. His death is not a noble death in that he falls on his own sword in defeat, and then his body is desecrated by the enemy. They take his headless body and they hang it on a wall. Finally, some Israelites go and they go get the body, and what do they do with it? Something you rarely see. They cremate the body and they bury the ashes under a tree. I mean, that's, that's not a dignified way for a Jewish king to be buried. A Jewish king buried in Jerusalem. Imagine, you know, cremation, buried under a tree, no mark or nothing. So even though his life was a failure and his death was dishonorable, David eulogizes Saul and his son after the death, and that's what begins 2 Samuel in chapter 1. And what's interesting in his eulogy is not what is said, it's what is unsaid. Very interesting in the eulogy. Uh, David you know, says of Saul, oh, I, I skipped one. David says of Saul that he was, you know, he was a handsome man and he was a good soldier and he was a king who brought prosperity and uh, he will, uh, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be missed. You know, I've had to do funerals like that. I've had the funeral parlor call me up, you know, the local funeral parlor call me up and say, look, we have a Mr. You know, Smith over here and uh, uh, he has no church affiliation, never went to church, not, not a believer or anything, but his family would like at least a minister you know, to conduct a funeral service. So what do you do? You, know, you got this rascal right in front of you, you know, never darkened the door of a church building, you know, had two wives and six girlfriends, uh, you know, uh, used his money in gambling, and I, I'm not making this up. I'm, I'm talking about a real person here. What do you say? Well, you know, he was a human being, and his mother loved him. You know, you search around for something to say. Well, that's exactly what David was saying about Saul. He was a good soldier. Well, yeah, true. He was the king. Yeah, that's true too. He, loved the, he was loved by the people for a time, yeah, he was. You know, he's careful, he's diplomatic in saying what he's saying. But he didn't say that Saul was a man of God. He didn't say that he was a man of faith. He didn't say that he was a man of honor. Now the great joy for a minister, uh, in a sense, is uh, you know, if you have to do funerals, is to do a funeral for a, a faithful Christian brother or sister. Yeah, that, those are easy, those funerals, because there's just too much to say. You have to pick, this, you have to pick out of so many good things, you just have to pick. That, that, makes a, that makes it a whole lot easier to eulogize a person that has a good and faithful, not perfect life, but a good and faithful life. Now when you compare what was said about Saul to what later was said about David, that David was a son of God, that he was God's servant, that he was God's friend, you realize that he had a chance at greatness, Saul that is, but he never truly arrived at the level that his successor David finally achieved. So even in his eulogy, nothing great can be said about Saul, except that from his sad life, there are tremendous lessons that we can draw for ourselves or anyone in, in any generation. So as we complete our brief study of Saul's life, I, I do want to draw out a couple of general lessons we can use from his failed life and truth. Remember the, the, the name of the series is Lessons from the Kings. So let's draw some lessons from Saul's life. Lesson number one, 
Greatness can only be achieved on God's terms, not our terms. In order to be great in God's eyes, in order to succeed in the spiritual world, you've got to do it according to God's commands. You've got to do it uh, with the view of God's purpose. You know, part of my prayer is not only God, please help me do this and please help me do that, but part of it also is please help me do what I want to do or what I need to do so that it achieves your purpose. Because I can be doing a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? And, and I can be doing a lot of things that are not necessarily bad, but I want to be, you know, I want to make sure that what I'm doing is also fulfilling what God's purpose is for my life. You know, in the world, who do we celebrate? Well, we, who gets the ink? Who gets the publicity? Well, the rebels get the publicity. What is it, that basketball player, you know, just recently, what does he do? He goes to a brothel, spends $75,000 on prostitutes and drugs, nearly dies, you know, has a stroke because of a drug overdose, and what happens? The newspapers are filled with stories about this individual. And yet the stories about individuals who are saving lives, helping people, supporting people, sacrificing themselves you know, for others, pff, they, we don't hear about those guys. So in the world you know, we celebrate rebels, those who break all the rules. We make heroes of those who defy authority. But I'll tell you something, you cannot impress God with this type of behavior. You might be able to impress, you know, impress the world with this behavior. God wants the complete opposite. He wants a person who is hungry to do what is right, a person who yearns to know and do God's will, not our will, not my will. Even Jesus said, not my will. Listen now, even the, perf even the person who was perfect, the person who committed no sin, even that person, Jesus, said, not my will, let your will be done. So how can we, who are imperfect, sinful, failing, how can we ever choose our own will over God's will? See what I'm saying? Saul tried to reign and be a great king according to his own terms, he failed miserably. So a person's stature with God is directly proportionate to his or her obedience to his will. Am I doing okay, God? Well, hmm, you know, how am I in your, uh, you know, in your estimation? Well, take a look at how I'm obeying you. Now don't misunderstand me. We are saved by faith, absolutely. And faith is what God wants from us. But faith is expressed through our attempt to do God's will. Faith is not expressed through perfection. Faith is expressed through the attempt at perfection. The attempt at doing what God wants us to do. So to be a great person of faith, one must be a great person of obedience. One of the things you know, in seminars about uh, family and raising children, so on and so forth, that's why it's so important to teach our children, you know, get the obedience muscle you know, uh, uh, exercised in children. You, know, you have little children, you have to say no what, 150 times a day? No, I said no. No, we don't climb up on the chair. No, get down from the chair. No, okay, time out. No, 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 no. Do this. You have to listen to mommy. Why? Because you have to listen to mommy or dad. Why? Well, if you could break it down to them, because I'm trying to teach you how to obey me. Because if you don't know how to obey me, your father or your mother or your grandfather or your grandmother, you will never be able to obey God. That's why. These rebels, these unbelievers, why can't they get it? Well, because they don't know how to obey. It frightens them. They've been raised in an environment where they get to do whatever they want. So you can imagine when they come to salvation, when they come to believing God, when they come to the point of having a relationship with God and they recognize, wait a minute, you mean my relationship with the God, the true God, is based on my obedience to Him? Whoa. That's a tall order if you've, never <laughs> if you've never learned how to obey your earthly parents. Very important. 
To be a great person of faith, one must be a great person of obedience. Number two lesson, the wage of sin is death. That's something we all know. Paul explains in Romans 6.23 that the end result of sin in our lives is death. Now we need to understand that death isn't simply the final separation of the soul from the body, it is that. But death has a lot of forms, all of which eventually culminate in the separation of the body from the spirit. We see the face of death where? Well, we see it in war and hatred and violence. We see it in laziness and despair. We see it in dishonesty and immorality. We see the face of death in pride and foolishness and disbelief, in sorrow, pain, loss, all of these things. Those are the faces of death before it actually comes. And the faces of death are all caused by sin. Again, I mentioned that basketball player. What, what was the, what's the root cause of all of his trouble? Here's a young guy, he's a millionaire, he's famous, you know, successful, 35 years old, and he's in the hospital fighting for his life, disgraced himself publicly, and what is the root problem there? Well, sin, that's the root problem. There are so many others um, that had so many other things that have this effect on our, on our lives. Saul you know, never weighed the consequences of his sins. He was arrogant, he was foolish. And these brought failure and fear and ultimately led to his death. So if we learn anything from Saul, we should learn that there are always consequences for our sins, always, always consequences. This should make us think twice before we knowingly disobey or ignore the Lord's command. And then one more lesson before we uh, wrap it up here. God wants to save us. I mean, look at all the times God reached out to Saul in order to save him. He gave him chances to do better, to reconcile with David, chances to repent and start over again. And every time Saul would ignore or reject the opportunity set before him by God, he would pass on it. So God treats us in the same way. We also have many chances to do better, to start over, to make things right. So every time our conscience you know, twinges, you get a twinge of your conscience, that's God calling you. That's the Spirit you know, poking you in the head. Dink! Every time you're convicted by something you read in the Bible, God is calling you. They don't call it the living word for nothing. Every time you attend services, for example, God is calling somebody to come forward. Every week we have the ample opportunity from God to be saved, to be restored, to deepen our commitment. All the time He's always calling us. So the same God who reached out to Saul reaches out to us today. Why? Because He loves us and because He wants to save us. So let's, you know, this lesson, God wants to save us, God isn't your enemy. You know, God isn't the one trying to make you feel bad. He's the one trying to make you feel good. He's the one trying to save you, to help you, to help you deal with the difficulties in life. Okay, so plenty of good lessons. Surely there are others from the life of Saul, but we're going to wrap it up right there and continue next week with uh, um, I think we're going to go to David uh, next week, or we might go to a, some obscure king uh, to see a, a, a lesson about, um, uh, a lesson about uh, suspicion, I think called Suspicious Minds. That's it for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>